History as it happens, January 12th, 2023. House Divided, part two. Mr. McCarthy doesn't have the votes today. He will not have the votes tomorrow. And he will not have the votes next week, next month, next year. Members are reminded not to engage in personalities against other members of the House. Who can unify the party? Who can deliver results? The American people, understandably, after the events of this week, recognize that the Congress is at a fork in the road and are asking the question, what direction will we choose? The 118th Congress is underway after the longest speakership battle since the years before the Civil War. And House Republicans are pursuing their agenda. Where's it all heading? Well, in the 1850s, the unbridgeable chasm over slavery led to civil war. Today, hyperpartisanship and anti-government fanaticism threaten liberal government itself. And that's next as we connect past and present, as we report history as it happens podcast from the Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. What surprised me with the election of Kevin McCarthy is that we have a whole party that was being sort of held hostage by these 20 odd extremists, congressmen and women. In most of those civil war speakership contests that I alluded to, a compromise candidate was often found and you would have both sides agreeing on that compromise candidate. One couldn't visualize that happening today. The performances that had us all watching C-SPAN a week ago were important. They allowed Americans to see the people who would be running one chamber of commerce in action. Maybe the right person for the job of Speaker of the House isn't someone who wants it so bad. Maybe the right person for the job of Speaker of the House isn't someone who has sold shares of themselves for more than a decade to get it. But the act, the theatrics of electing Kevin McCarthy will not be the most important thing we remember. It was but a prelude to the main event, how the pro-Trump Republican Party will legislate, will govern after narrowly winning back control of the House last year. A Pew Research poll in October, right before the midterms, found that the economy was the top issue for voters overall. And for Republican voters, 92 percent said the economy was very important. 65 percent for Democrats. Other top issues were the future of American democracy, education, health care, energy policy, crime, guns, abortion, Supreme Court appointments, immigration, foreign policy, Just going down the list in order of importance here. Investigations of Donald Trump or Joe Biden were far less important, although those poll results did reflect the partisan divide. Even so, only 55 percent of Republican voters said investigating Biden was very important. Well, it took two days for the new House Oversight Committee, now chaired by Kentucky Republican James Comer, to announce it is asking the Treasury Department for information about President Biden's family finances and demanding that Twitter execs come to Washington to answer allegations they hid information about the Biden family business dealings. Republicans also announced a number of other moves that appear to be designed to satisfy their far-right base and will likely receive no cooperation from House Democrats and go nowhere in the Senate. For instance, an anti-abortion bill Republicans passed on Wednesday. The days of divided government are back, and some would say that's good because Democrats were unlikely to exercise effective oversight of the White House. But as our guest in our most recent episode, Sean Wilentz, said, what we're really witnessing now is a kind of political crack-up. A far-right fringe is steering a Republican Party that has become increasingly radical. Whereas the fights in the 1850s that led to Howell Cobb and Nathaniel Banks being elected House Speaker were over slavery— Today's conflict involves liberal government itself. The abolitionists whose activism influenced politics were the disruptors of their day. They wanted to upset the status quo which had kept slavery out of national politics. It was simply too important an issue, morally, economically, everything, to have it marginalized by political leaders afraid to touch it because it was indeed so explosive. Well, today's disruptors don't seem to be pursuing justice as the abolitionists did. What are they after? Where is all this going? Not another civil war, of course. But then where? Manisha Sinha is a historian at the University of Connecticut, a leading authority on the history of slavery and abolition 
in the Civil War and Reconstruction. Her most recent book is The Slave's Cause, A History of Abolition. Manisha Sinha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So, as you know, in the first conversation I had about this topic with Sean Wilentz, we focused a bit more on the politics inside Congress in the 1850s, as we were drawing parallels to what we witnessed in the House last week. And maybe today we'll talk a little bit more about the politics outside Congress or the activism outside Congress to see how it affected legislators who then engaged in these brawls literally (laughs) over the speakership. Because my sense is that just like today, in the 1850s, it was probably hard for observers to discern who was influencing whom. Were lawmakers driving events? Were the activists and the abolitionists pushing lawmakers to catch up or both? I mean, that could be the dynamic, of course. Because in today's context, I often wonder if members of Congress aren't more radical than American voters who are watching what transpired in Congress. So why don't we just begin there before we dive into the history. What were you thinking as you watched the speakership battle over Kevin McCarthy? Well, you know, as a historian of abolition and anti-slavery politics, I think the relationship between activism on the ground, outside the halls of Congress, and politics within Congress and within the federal government, they're related. They have a symbiotic relationship. If we disregard one or the other, we never get the full picture. Uh, As I was watching the speakership contest over Kevin McCarthy, you know, like most Civil War historians, I thought of those long drawn out speakers elections in the mid 19th century. And many times those contests were long drawn out because of the sectional conflict over slavery between North and South. But there were many actors, as you mentioned, that brought that conflict to the forefront and that resulted in in sort of partisan breakdown also within Congress over the issue of slavery. What surprised me with the election of Kevin McCarthy is that we have a whole party that was being sort of held hostage by these 20 odd extremists congressmen and women. In most of those civil war speakership contests that I alluded to, a compromise candidate was often found. And you would have both sides agreeing on that compromise candidate. One couldn't visualize that happening today, right? You could imagine a moderate candidate being elected, maybe with Democratic votes, because the Republican majority is so narrow in the House, with a few moderate Republicans joining them. But that scenario, even when it was mentioned, was completely unlikely because they would not have found, I think, even one or two moderate Republicans willing to go down that route. So now what we have is McCarthy being elected by literally giving away the House to this extreme group within the Republican Party that basically held the speakership contest and the House hostage with their votes and had McCarthy simply give in to them. So instead of the Republicans trying to sort of refashion themselves and perhaps emerge in a two-party system, it's important to have two parties that have a sort of common understanding of democratic governance and of ideas about how we get things done in government. They simply, you know, remain hostage to these 20 people. And I think you're right. The extremism represented by many of these men and women, many of whom representatives who had questioned the 2020 presidential elections, is a minority within a minority. They do not represent clearly the opinions of a majority of American voters. If nothing else, the 2022 midterm elections have shown us that. As I was watching the drama play out as it entered its second and third day, I also wondered, what would it take for a faction of Democrats to approach a faction of Republicans and try to strike a deal here to undermine or pull the rug out from underneath the the 20 irreconcilables? But you're right, it never came to that. There was really no drama that it would ever be or not be McCarthy. This is one parallel that I think works with the 1850s, that in situations like this, a fringe holds a lot of power. 
Absolutely. You can certainly compare it to the 1850s. There are a lot of people running around who say, oh, we are at that moment of political divisiveness. We are at civil war level of political confrontation. But I'm not, as a historian, I'm not one of those who is predicting another civil war or think that we are simply repeating the civil war because history does not repeat. It does not even rhyme. We live with the long legacies of those conflicts, surely it shapes our political landscape, it shapes our current events today, but it's not exactly the same thing. So I would, for instance, refer to the 1849 speakership contest that also went on for a long time, and you ended up with a Southern Unionist who was elected speaker, and he was elected with the votes of free soilers right, who are against the expansion of slavery, but they would rather have Howell Cobb become the speaker as a compromise candidate than Robert Winthrop, who was what was known as a cotton wig, very much in cahoots with the slave power. And at that time, for your listeners who don't know, the Republican Party emerged as a third party only in the 1850s. At that time in the two-party system, you had the Democrats and the Whigs, with the Democrats leaning more and more towards the South and becoming more pro-slavery uh, as one approaches the Civil War. But that the Free Soilers had a policy, a principle, behind their opposition to Robert Winthrop. They saw him as the worst kind of Northern politician who was giving in to the demands of what they called the slave power, right? And they held the balance of power, but they were agreed to elect a slaveholding Southerner like Howell Cobb, who was a Democrat, but he was a unionist and he was not a secessionist. And at that time, secession sentiment was rife in the South, especially in the Deep South states. So to me, those free soilers stood for principle, while these 20 irreconcilables, as you aptly call them, I'm not sure what they were trying to demonstrate, except to say that they had the power to control the election of the Republican speaker. They were literally demonstrating their power to do that, My next question is about that, actually. I want to return to 1849 and the Free Soil Party in a moment. What were these 20 rogues up to? In my conversation with Sean Wilentz, he said, you know, in the 1850s, the issue was slavery. Some folks today are saying this isn't really about an issue. It's more about power. But there could be an issue at the heart of what we're watching here, and that is liberal governance itself, the ability to have a functioning government. And as the Republican Party in its current manifestation has gotten more and more radical over the last three decades, it has attacked the very notion of having a functioning government. I mean, that's what the critics would say. Yes, absolutely. They would, in fact, say that. And that's because the Republican Party, the modern Republican Party, I'm not talking about the party of Lincoln and the party of anti-slavery, which was the party of big government and racial liberalism. I'm talking about the Republican Party of today, which has adopted the kind of states' rights platform of the old Democratic Party, which is very anti-big government. So I would say that that ideology of being anti-big government, anti-federal government, against regulation of the economy, those positions actually define the entire Republican Party. And that is something that mainstream conservative Republicans share with some of these more extreme elements. The extreme elements, though, now are at a position where they are so anti-government that they basically want to wreck the system of government that we have in place right now. It goes far beyond what Ronald Reagan would call for with his anti-government message. This is further to the right than that. So they're both anti-government, but it seems to me that these, what they're called, they're called MAGA Republicans or those who who cheered on the January 6th insurrection, who did not want to certify the presidential elections. It seems they're against the American experiment in democratic government right? They seem to be willing to burn down the house. And in that sense, they remind me less of the free soilers, but more of the secessionists. The fire eaters. Uh, Absolutely. The fire eaters, the ones who refused to accept the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. They're a lot more like them. 
Fundamentally, secession was about rejecting the results of a free election. And how free was it? Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot, wasn't allowed to be on the ballot in the South. Uh, One more point about what you said there before we dive headlong into the 1840s and 50s about whether we're heading to a civil war. I agree. We're not going towards civil war or secession or anything like that. I think the parallel is we have a cycle of polarization now. And maybe it doesn't reflect where the American people are, but you see it in our politics, you see it on social media, you see it in the news media, especially cable news. We have this cycle of polarization where you're wondering, what's it going to take to break the fever? Well, I think there has to be accountability in our system, right? I think it's been really quite awful that we've had the January 6th insurrection. We have people serving in Congress who may have been complicit. And despite the January 6th investigation, the people who were responsible for that travesty have not been brought to justice so far. Uh, And unless we have that accountability, the fever is not going to be broken because then it's always going to be portrayed as simply another partisan divide. No, it isn't another simple partisan divide. This is far more serious. And the tragedy is that so few Republicans got that point. You know, Lynn Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, they are no longer in Congress. They sort of lost their political power because they refuse to go that far. And I want to quickly allude to something you said earlier about Lincoln not being on the ballot in the South in 1860. Well, yes, there were free and fair elections in the North. There wasn't in the South. They didn't let Lincoln on the ballot. You know, uh, the South had become a pretty much a closed society when it came to the issue of slavery. It was a place where abolitionists could get lynched simply for talking out against slavery. That kind of closeness of mind, of trying to determine what can be taught in schools, they got rid of Northern textbooks. They got rid of any allusion to slavery that was even slightly critical That kind of closeness, I see it being repeated now. Uh, And interesting enough, it's many times those same states that are doing that today. As a historian, I'm really concerned about the censorship of history and of textbooks and what is being taught of manufactured controversies or banning books. These are not signs of an open, free and democratic society. These are signs of an authoritarian impulse. And that worries me. And I think the American experiment can last only if we hold these elements to account and make sure that we do not have a kind of politics that is actually unconstitutional in our system of government. In the 1850s, you saw people in the North celebrating John Brown's raid, for instance, uh, the beating of Charles Sumner by Preston Brooks. Dueling narratives formed where those events were interpreted differently depending on which part of the country you were from. And you would say, well, if something like that happened today, it would get universally condemned. Well, no, we saw on January 6th and in its aftermath, dueling narratives about what actually happened. You know, I actually wound up on the email list for this group that claims to represent the people who have been jailed for the uh, January 6th riot and how they are really political prisoners, (laughs) you know, uh, kind of turning it on its head. So not to digress about that, but yeah. Yes, I mean, those people who think that the January 6th insurrection was a protest or tourists, I think somebody said. Or legitimate. Washington, or even legitimate, you know, we have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and we have the right to protest. But you don't have the right to storm the Congress carrying a Confederate flag, a Confederate flag or waving the Nazi swastika. These are inherently un-American things. And that's why I use the term insurrection, because it is very similar to what Southern slaveholders try to do, which is to break up the union and break up our democracy because they could not control it anymore. You know, I used to pride myself about the fact about Abraham Lincoln not being on the Southern ballot or the ballots in the South. I used to pride myself on being able to name all four people who ran for president in 1860. Lincoln, Stephen Douglas was a Northern Democrat. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the Southern Democrat's name, but John Breckinridge. That's right. John Breckinridge. And then Bell was the constitutional unionists in the South. 
anti-secessionists yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it is. and okay. and and if you think of the Constitutional <laughs> Union Party, which literally was invented for the 1860 election, it was made up of Northern and Southern moderates, and their platform was simply for the Constitution and the Union because they could not agree on anything else. The John Bell and Edward Everett ticket. That's all that they could agree on, that they wanted to preserve the union. They couldn't come up with any policy in their platform. What frightened me about the Republican Party in the 2020 presidential elections was that it had no platform. It had no policy positions. You know, even with Nixon, with Reagan, you think of all the the conservative Republican presidents who have been elected. They had a platform. They had policy positions. George Bush, the two Bushes. But where do you go in a party which becomes a party where they cannot agree on a platform because they are for a repressive big government, but not government programs? And that, I think, is really dangerous in a two-party system where both parties have to be trusted with political power. Both parties have to be trusted with following the rules of the political game, of democracy, conceding power when you lose, winning, and then governing according to constitutional limits. Where do you go when all those barriers, those institutional... That is the nightmare that Hamilton and that Madison, et cetera, imagined, a tyrant who might break up the American experiment in representative government. Those are norms you're mentioning. They aren't laws. Yeah. Norms are more important than laws in certain respects. So we talked about uh, third parties there and how we have this two-party system, so it's incumbent upon them both to respect one another and our norms. That's a good segue to get to 1849, which was the uh, longest, most contentious speakership vote in the House since 1820, as I mentioned to Sean Wilentz, when John Taylor needed 22 ballots to prevail in the heart of the Missouri controversy. We already mentioned it before. We had this third party, the Liberty Party, or no, no, Free Soil Party. There was a Liberty Party, but the Free Soil Party. And we know in American history that it's very difficult for third parties to last longer than, what was it said once, a bee sting, right? And then they get co-opted or whatever. And uh, the Liberty Party, the Free Soil Party were basically one issue parties, right? Slavery was it. But here we have it in 1849, where you had nine free soil representatives in a very evenly divided chamber between Democrats and Whigs. So what was the impetus behind the Free Soil Party? How did they manage to get nine people elected to Congress? Well, here is a very good instance of seeing how the abolitionists actually affected the political landscape. You're right that some of these major speakership contests took place over the issue of slavery. You mentioned John Taylor's election in 1820, very narrow election during the Missouri crisis. Taylor was not an abolitionist, but he was an anti-slavery man identified with the New York Manumission Society, which was an abolitionist society. And his attempt to prevent Missouri coming into the Union as a slave state was very much what abolitionists wanted. And that's why his election was so contentious, because slaveholders, of course, were not too happy with that. Eventually, he was elected. And the second time he's elected later on, he actually wins with a greater majority. And by that time, he has compromised and softened his own anti-slavery position. But the entire antebellum two-party system worked. The Whigs and the Democrats They worked after the Missouri crisis by silencing the issue of slavery. There was a gag rule in Congress against abolitionist petitions. They didn't even want to discuss it. It was simply tabled. They deferred over economic issues, right, over the role of the government in the economy. But they did not defer over slavery because both parties were intersectional alliances of Southerners and Northerners. And that's how it worked. And the idea was that, oh, if we bring up the question of slavery, and we have sectional parties, that will destroy the union. That was Jefferson's fire bell in the night. And that's exactly what the abolitionists are doing in the 1830s and 40s. They are agitating in the North, even in the face of very hostile reception by mobs, sometimes racist mobs, who would attack their meetings. That's right. William Um, Lloyd Garrison was nearly lynched in Boston, I believe. 
or something. Exactly. He was. And African-Americans are being attacked. Their neighborhoods are being attacked and razed to the ground. Their churches are being burned by racist mobs. So you can see that this issue is is highly volatile. But abolitionists persist, and they persist in petitioning, in trying to mail literature. And in those struggles, they show most Northerners that Southerners are willing to violate freedom of press. Remember the murder of of Elijah Lovejoy, the abolitionist editor in Illinois, which Lincoln noted They are willing to go against the Bill of Rights, basically, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly on the issue of slavery. And this converts many Northerners to an anti-slavery position. So when the Liberty Party emerges as an independent abolitionist party, it actually does well in abolition strongholds in Massachusetts, in upstate New York. And many times they hold the balance of power. But it's really the Free Soil Party in the aftermath of the Mexican War that actually makes a big political showing. Because unlike the Liberty Party, they said, we are going to drop the demand for the abolition of slavery because that's not constitutional. States can abolish slavery. The federal government cannot. We are going to drop the Liberty Party's emphasis on Black equality, on equal civil and political rights for Black people, because that's not popular. Okay, most people, even in the North, would not go so far. Only a handful of New England states gave Black men the right to vote before the Civil War. So the free soil platform, the non-expansion of slavery, proves to be fairly popular in the North. And they managed to elect, as you mentioned, people to Congress. And their presidential ticket does much better than the Liberty Party ticket ever did throughout the 1840s. It's Martin Van Buren, the former president, former Democrat, and Charles Francis Adams, the son and grandson of presidents in a Whig. They're the free soil ticket. They lose, but the free soil party has had enough of an impact in the North for Southern slaveholders to be very nervous about the emergence of anti-slavery political power. And this is where I want to really emphasize, I say this in my book, because the general tendency is to look at abolitionists as this kind of minority, this fanatical minority that had no impact on American politics. In fact, they did. They literally seeded the ground, plowed the ground that made that free soil success possible. And of course, they are helped because the Mexican war is seen as a land grab for slavery. Even moderate Whigs like Lincoln view it that way. They're anti-war. The Democrats, especially Southerners, are gung-ho because this means more territory for slavery. So Really, the Free Soil Party, when they come up, they want to break that silence over slavery in the halls of power in Washington, D.C., in Congress. And they want to hold both the major parties accountable over the issue of slavery. Now, of course, after this showdown over the speakership contest, which Howell Cobb wins with the support of the Free Soilers against Robert Winthrop, the so-called Cotton Whig, from Massachusetts and who was very against free soilers, very anti-abolitionists, you have the Compromise of 1850. And the Free Soil Party kind of disappears. They call themselves Free Democrats, whatever, but as a political organization, it disappears. But many of these senators and representatives who were very faithful to anti-slavery principle remain. People like Senator Charles Sumner, Garrett Smith, who's really an abolitionist from upstate New York, he's in Congress. And these are the people who then form the kernel of the appeal that would lead to the formation of the Republican Party. So the Free Soil Party disappears, but they really are precursors to the emergence of the Republican Party. And that's the last time in American history that you had the emergence of a successful third party. And they replace the Whigs as the major second party. I look forward to asking you about these events in a moment, about what happens after Kansas, Nebraska, and the disintegration, the disappearance of the Whigs, the splits in the Democrats, and then the emergence of this anti-slavery coalition into the Republicans. But about the 1849 speakership battle, I mean, did this take people by surprise that it would go 63 ballots and the need for someone like Howell Cobb, who probably wasn't at the top of the list when it all began? And did it scare the two major parties? 
It did, because both the major parties were intersexual coalitions, right? They had their southern wings, they had their northern wings, and they had been able to win elections, even with the slavery issue, by playing it one way in the north and one way in the south. But at this point, with the Mexican War, they realized, just as they you know, struggle over the entrance of Missouri as a slave state, the United States conquered territory from Mexico that nearly doubled its size. Are these territories going to be slave or free? That would determine the future of the republic. And that's why a moderate anti-slavery Whig like Lincoln opposes the Mexican War as a land grab for slavery. People realize that this was going to determine the future of the republic. And this becomes a national issue. It was nothing that could be swept under the rug or played locally in different ways in the North and South. The fact that the Free Soil ticket had Martin Van Buren, who was considered a pro-slavery Democrat in the 1830s, at the head of its ticket showed you how far Northerners had gone in resenting the control that slaveholders exercised over the federal government. That's yeah. right. There were defections already in the 1840s from the Northern Democrats. So They were point, called bond burners. Yeah. There was also uh, the New York Silver Grays. We don't have time to get into <laughs> Yeah, those the, were the conservative Whigs. Yeah, conservative uh, Whigs. The Silver Grays, the, then the Cotton Whigs from Massachusetts, who had, you know, interest in cotton textiles, which basically functioned with slave-grown cotton from the South. Politics was more interesting in those days. Unfortunately, it all ended in a civil war. To your point about abolitionists and how they are viewed today, their impact on anti-slavery politics. So many years ago, I read Henry Mayer's book about William Lloyd Garrison, and I got it into my mind what the pure abolitionist, the ultimate abolitionist, was supposed to look like and sound like. Well, I have come to realize in the intervening years that the Garrisonians in some ways have given abolitionists a bad name historically, not because he wasn't a good man and not because he wasn't a brave man. He was but because they were not political abolitionists. They eschewed politics, at least for a while anyway, whereas these other anti-slavery and abolitionist figures engaged with the political system to bring about the end of slavery. Well, I see it a little differently. I know uh, there are historians like Sean Valens and others who give a lot of credit to the political abolitionists for bringing the issue of slavery into the political realm. But I think both sides, the Garrisonians and the political abolitionists were really important. And in the end, they had more in common than what divided them. The idea that Garrisonians were apolitical and that they just uh, engaged in moral suasionist tactics is actually ahistorical. Interesting. Garrison was a political creature. You just have to read The Liberator Mm -hmm. and see the way he reprints the speeches of John Quincy Adams and other conscience wigs like William Slade and Charles Sumner. Sumner is very influenced by Garrison. The first abolitionist newspaper he reads is Garrison. Garrison's paper. Similarly, John Brown, who thinks he's going to start a slave rebellion, is very influenced by Garrison, who's a pacifist. He remembers as a child reading The Liberator. So I think it's a caricature to say that Garrison was apolitical. What Garrison did was he believed in the politics of agitation. And when he saw the Democratic and Whig Party, and he saw the gag rule controversy, he really felt that the slave power and slaveholders controlled the federal government. He was right about that. He was right about that. But his method was that we should have no union with Southern slaveholders and no compromise with the evil of slavery, right? Uh, While political abolitionists are saying, no, we must work within the system to dethrone the slave power. Right. But if you look at the 1850s, the Whig Party disintegrates after the Compromise of 1850 because its southern and northern factions simply cannot agree. And you have a vacuum in the north politically. And you have the emergence of the know nothings. You have emergence of temperance people and anti slavery. But it's really anti slavery that ultimately galvanizes a majority of northerners. And it's partly because of the politics of agitation that Garrison had developed. And in the end, during the Civil War, It's really Garrison who becomes an ardent Lincoln supporter, 
And Lincoln acknowledges him, you know, when he is lauded for being the great emancipator, he says, don't, don't praise me, praise the original abolitionists, like William Lloyd Garrison, whom he invites to the Republican National Convention. So I think Garrison's politics of agitation had an impact. And in the end, both the sides proved to be right, right? You had emancipation politically, because the Republican Party came into power and the Emancipation Proclamation is issued during the Civil War. But Garrison's notion, which I actually traced to a Black abolitionist, James W.C. Pennington, that the Constitution is a covenant with death and an agreement with hell because it will lead to bloodshed, also came true with the war. I think it's a complicated story, and I tell that story in my book. I am not one of those historians who take sides over this. It's a radical social movement, debating strategies and tactics. And in the end, I think both these sides end up sort of being correct in predicting what happens. After the South leaves, Garrison becomes the biggest cheerleader for the Union, for the Lincoln administration. He even says, let's disband now, because now (laughs) the center of politics has moved to the federal government itself. It's the Republican Party now that is going to take the reins. We as the abolitionist society, American Anti-Slavery Society, we've kind of done our job. This doesn't mean that he doesn't believe in the fight for black rights. He does. But he thinks that the, the center of action has moved from abolitionist activism to the halls of government itself once Lincoln and the Republicans came into power. Well, let's stay with Garrison then for a minute. I'm with you on the importance of the agitation. And as a journalist myself, I certainly admired Garrison's ability to keep his newspaper, The Liberator, alive and going for all those years, under duress often. And Mm -hmm. yes, you know, messaging is important, but it's not enough. Now, I know you said that Garrison wasn't entirely against politics. He was a political creature, but he also was a against having people vote in elections. He thought the Constitution, at least for a time, was irredeemable. And as you mentioned, he supported Northern secession, if you will. But those aren't actual solutions to the problem of slavery. Well, that's another, I think, a misnomer for Garrisonian abolitionism. He did not, in fact, advocate Northern secession. He just said that the North should no longer be complicit in upholding slavery. And the time when he burned the Constitution was when Anthony Burns is rendered back to slavery from Boston. Under right? the Fugitive Slave 18, Act. Under the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. And he said Southern laws of slavery are being sort of implemented in the free state of Massachusetts. And he burns the fugitive slave clause of the Constitution. That's not a popular act because 19th century Americans revered nothing better than the Bible and the Constitution. If you had those two things on your side, and that's why pro-slavery ideologues and anti-slavery people would always evoke the Bible and the Constitution as being on their side. Garrison never said people should not vote. He says, I will not vote because it's a corrupt system, but you can vote. He was for women's rights. So political abolition is like we are already advocating an unpopular cause, which is black equality, right, in a country where 90 percent of African-Americans are enslaved. Why saddle us with another unpopular cause like women's rights? He was an extreme pacifist. He was against all wars. He was virtually a Quaker in the way he thought about the government with the Seminole Wars, the Mexican Wars, which all he saw as pro-slavery, anti-Indian wars, he opposed them. So he was a radical thinker in that sense, right? Agreed, yeah. Uh, He set the bar for radicalism, right? But many of these political abolitionists had been converted by Garrison in the first place, but they thought they needed to take those politics into the government. And in the end, Frederick Douglass even agreed with them. He thought that Garrison, well, yeah, played a role, but now we need to say that the Constitution is on our side, the Bible is on our side. Historians are still debating yeah. about the nature of the Constitution, and Sean Valence is on one side of that equation, and there are other historians and lawyers on the other side. But the point is the Constitution was a compromise over the issue of slavery. It was a contested Garrison, document right from the beginning. It was, absolutely. 
absolutely. If you look at the debates, the Constitutional Convention and the debates of the that the abolitionists had amongst themselves are very interesting. The Garrisonians versus the political abolitionists because Madison's notes on the Constitution were published and made public for the first time in the 1840s. And then the abolitionists read that and you have somebody like Wendell Phillips, who's a Garrisonian lawyer, coming up with the notion that there were too many concessions to slaveholders in the Constitution that was too pro-slavery. And then you had the political abolitionists saying, no, we need to think about the spirit of the Constitution. We need to think of the fact that slavery and slaves are not mentioned. So we have a literal interpretation of the Constitution. Slavery is not there. And that we can galvanize it for our side. And that was a politically smart tactic too, because you were not going to get many Northern votes by saying that the Constitution was pro-slavery. Because Northerners also revered the Constitution. And it is also true, I think, as Bilenz and others have pointed out, that Southerners had made the Constitution more and more pro-slavery by their outrageous demands, meaning they had interpreted it in more and more pro-slavery ways, which created that impasse in the mid-19th century. But, you know, it's important to take, not to reduce their positions that, you know, oh, Garrison had no politics, what he said about democracy, et cetera, was, you know, had no effect because it in fact did. So where are the votes coming for the Liberty Party, the Free Soil Party, and then the Republican Party? Every county in New England voted for, for Lincoln in the 1860 elections. How does that happen? It is those abolitionist lecture circuits. You could literally do a map of strongholds of abolitionism in the North, New England, upstate New York, the upper North, and predict the results of the 1856 and 1860 elections. Even Garrison with his position is important because if he hadn't put into play his newspaper, his and that's why I say we need to think of the abolitionists, not just some sort of individual crazy reformers, but it was a radical interracial social movement made up of ordinary blacks and whites, men and women, we don't see that kind of mass movement in the United States until the civil rights movement. Sorry, they were and the first we, civil rights movement in our country, the opponents of slavery. Yeah, yes. I mean, that it's become a popular <laughs> way for many historians to talk about abolition. But remember, before they could talk about civil rights, they had to first get rid of human bondage. I read Kate Mazur's book last year, so maybe I got that from there. So <laughs> yeah. one more question about Garrison. What did you think of Henry Mayer's book? I actually really liked it. When I began researching abolition, I realized that mainstream academia really had done a terrible job of writing a history of the abolition movement, that they had accepted, in fact, Southern caricatures of the abolitionist movement as some sort of Northern middle class, white bourgeois movement, shredding crocodile tears over the plight of slaves and being blind to the sufferings of, around them, that they knew nothing. They were armchair philosophers who knew nothing about slavery and who had created an agitation. It was part of the whole lost cause mythology of the Civil War. This was deeply entrenched in American historiography. And then by the 70s, 60s and 70s, suddenly post 60s and 70s, white abolitionists are portrayed as economic conservatives, racially paternalistic views of abolition that were not based on abolitionist archives. The only people I think that actually presented a fair assessment of the abolition movement were African-American scholars and activists. Because they knew that Garrison didn't just emerge out of anywhere. He emerged actually from this milieu of 1820s Black abolitionist milieu, right? That's right. He was uh, very influenced by African Americans. He is influenced by David Walker's appeal to the colored citizens of the world. You know, his paper is basically bankrolled by African Americans. He has over 450 subscribers only the first year, out of which 400 are African-Americans. His agents are black abolitionists everywhere. Whites come late to Garrisonian philosophical radicalism on the issue of slavery and black rights. He's getting this from African-Americans. So I found that I needed to go back to those archives to do them justice. And that's how I ended up writing The Slave's Cause and really getting an appreciation for Garrison and realizing that some of the best books on Garrison were written not by mainstream academic historians, but by an independent scholar 
like Henry Mayer, but there was one book, I should say, that is really good on the conflict within the abolition movement between Garrisonians and political abolitionists. And that's a book by Eileen Craditor. It's an old book. Uh, she was on the left and then she moved to the right. So people on the left don't like her and people on the right don't <laughs> like her because she was all over the place throughout her academic career. But this book, Means and Ends in American Abolitionism, is really good because it is a very fair assessment of the split in the abolition movement. And it really tears down, and it came out really in, in the 60s or 70s, it tears down those myths about abolition. In the 60s and 70s, there were some historians, especially influenced by the civil rights movement. Many of those activists saw themselves as the new abolitionists who wrote, I think, sort of fair accounts of the abolition movement. And not only that, I found errors. Errors and quotations, errors and events by mainstream historians who wow. should have been more careful. So their bias clearly affected the way they told the story. I read Mayer's book about 10 years ago. And as I mentioned, in the intervening years, scholars such as Sean Wilentz, who's a frequent guest on my podcast, James Oakes, a frequent guest on my podcast, have influenced my thinking about him. Although, again, I, I still do admire him, just not as much as I used to. But uh... Uh, well, Jim Oak said, Sean Relance, you know, I tend not to be partisan when I write about because I was writing about the abolition movement as a whole. So I was writing about the Garrisonians yeah. and the political abolitionists, and I could appreciate both their standpoints. And the fact that they all come together in the 1850s after their bitter divides in the 1840s and in the 1860s, that they're all in virtually in the same place showed to me that. When historians write about this, we should probably stop identifying with one side of this to, versus the other side. <laughs> I found both to be actually very useful. When Garrison dies, some of the best eulogies on him are made by political abolitionists. Interesting. Well, I'll have to have all of you on to debate this at some point. <laughs> so, well, we covered the ground here. I mean, Kansas, Nebraska happens, and that nullifies the Missouri Compromise. It opens a large swath of the Western United States to the possibility of slavery based on this idea of popular sovereignty that was pushed by Stephen Douglas. And that happens in spring of 1854. Then we have our elections in November of 1854. But the next Congress isn't seated until the following December. So 13 months later. And by that point, we have Democrats in the House, but the Northern Democrats had been drubbed in those elections because of Kansas, Nebraska. There are 51 know-nothing candidates in the House at that point. Uh, they are the nativists. And then there was what was called an anti-slavery or an anti-Nebraska coalition, uh, an oppositional coalition group of about 100 Congress members. They weren't the Republican Party just yet. So then out of that mix... How in the world did it take 133 ballots to elect Nathaniel Banks, Speaker of the House? His name came up in the news last week as we watched all of 15 ballots with Kevin McCarthy. People start pointing back to 1855, 1856. It was December through February. And Nathaniel Banks. Yes, you know, people said, thank God we didn't have 133 ballots as they did to elect Nathaniel Banks. I mean, we just had 15, right? But still, it was one of the longest speakership contests. You see, as you put it, politics was in flux in the mid-1850s. The Whig Party had died out, and there was no new party to take its place. But the people who took the initiative again in pointing the way to this anti-Nebraska, anti-slavery coalition were abolitionists. So in 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed, and there's a group of congressmen who issue a public appeal called Appeal of the Independent Democrats, because there's no other party, right? The Whigs have gone, and then there's the Democratic Party. The Free Soilers call themselves Free Democrats in 1852. In 1854, they call themselves Independent Democrats. And that appeal is written by Charles Sumner, Garrett Smith. You know, these people are abolitionists. And then they ask Northerners to publish this widely. And that's what leads to the drubbing of the Northern Democrats. It's not as if 
Kansas, Nebraska is passed, and suddenly the North is outraged and Northern Democrats are defeated. It took agitation and it took the appeal of the independent Democrats, which is an amazing document. It's literally one page. I ask everyone to read it. I make my students read it. Oh, I should read it too. It's an amazing document. I think it's one of those documents of American democracy that, that most American citizens should read, you know, like the Gettysburg Address or something, because that is what leads to the formation of the Republican Party. So the speakership contest, you're right, you know, the House is in flux because they cannot agree on a candidate. The Northern Democrat is defeated. The pro-slavery Southern Democrat, William Aiken, he's also defeated. William Richardson, I think, was the Northern Democrat. His position was slavery should be allowed to expand according to popular sovereignty rules. So he's basically a Douglas man a Stephen Douglas man. The Southern Democrat is that the federal government should ensure that slavery spreads. The anti-Nebraska anti-slavery coalition is saying it's the role of the federal government to prevent the expansion of slavery and that it is within the constitutional powers of the federal government to make sure that slavery does not spread in the territories. That becomes the anti-slavery platform of the Republican Party. Now, Nathaniel Banks is a strange creature. You know, he's elected but he's elected as a Republican. But before that, he'd been a Democrat. He'd been a know-nothing. From Massachusetts, where the know-nothings had done really, really well. Yes, they had. The nativists. You know, and, and they were nativists. But there were a lot of anti-slavery people who had no political home, did not want to go to the pro-slavery Democratic Party, who joined the nativists, but whose main principle was anti-slavery. So in Massachusetts, for instance, they desegregated the public school system. The nativist government did that because there was an anti-slavery element to that. Eventually, they disappear because like the Whigs and the Democrats, the know-nothings can't agree on slavery. And they split between northern and southern wings. So nativism did not prove to be enough of a political rallying cry. It's really anti-slavery. A lot of times these are seen as complementary, anti-slavery and nativism, but they were actually competing principles in the north. The next major party would have either been nativists like the know-nothings, if that is what mattered most to Northern citizens, or it would have been anti-slavery, which it became. By 1856, you know, the Republicans have a presidential candidate in John C. Fremont, and they condemn slavery and polygamy, referring to the Mormons, (laughs) as relics of barbarism, and they win the entire Upper North. They come very close. I mean, this has not happened in American history before or since. Right, that a new party emerges and comes close to winning the presidency in 1856. And I'm literally pointing the way to 1860. But the speakership contest is resolved in those long ballots, ultimately with Nathaniel Banks being elected speaker. He's a Republican by then, identifies as a Republican. He is put into power by that anti-Nebraska Republican coalition. But what it does signal is that the fever is breaking in Washington that this is the first significant political defeat besides the 1854 elections, that what was known as the slave power, slaveholders in the federal government suffer in Congress. They can see the future, a Northern anti-slavery majority. Hugely important point where they could see where politics were going and how remarkable how fast things changed in those days. So in the next Congress, so Nathaniel Banks is the speaker in what was the 34th Congress, the elections of 1854. As we mentioned, Congress isn't seated until the end of 1855. But to my point, in the following Congress, from 51 know-nothings, there are now only 14. So they're basically gone, swept away by the anti-slavery issue. There are 92 Republicans in the next Congress versus 127 Democrats. But most of those Democrats were Southern Democrats. Exactly. But the Democratic Party is also being riven apart over the issue of slavery. So here's Stephen Douglas, right? He is the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act that repeals the Missouri Compromise Line and allows for the spread of slavery on the principle of popular sovereignty that, you know, white settlers can basically vote slavery up and down in territories and states can come in as slave or free states in the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And that's what arouses northern anti-slavery feeling because Kansas is so far north that there should even be a possibility that it should be a slave state. And then you know the story of the Kansas Wars. You know, they're free soil settlers. 
armed companies of Southerners going into Kansas territory, trying to influence the elections. You know, when January 6th happened, a lot of people didn't realize we have had a history of political violence in political elections and the Kansas territorial elections are a great example of that. There were border ruffians, as they were known from Missouri, who would come into Kansas territory and vote illegally and go back, trying to make Kansas into a slave state. The sack of Lawrence took place. The sack of Lawrence, the beating of Sumner, all that is happening. This is really a challenge to democracy at the local level. And that's when Stephen Douglas who believed in the white man's democracy, who believed in popular sovereignty, he's had enough, right? He says, wait a minute, now you're violating the rights of white men voting, and you can't do that. I'm not going along with this. And there's a split in the Democratic Party, again, showing you the split that would occur between Northern and Southern Democrats in the 1860 presidential elections. He says, you can't violate white man's democracy. They should be allowed to vote slavery up and down. And if 90% of the white population of Kansas Territory wants to be a free state, you can't shove slavery down their throats. And you have this whole controversy of the Lee Compton Constitution in 1858. So that is the backdrop to the 1859 speakership controversy. The Republican candidate, John Sherman, who's actually a moderate Republican. Yes. You know, there's a radical faction. There's a more. He's actually a moderate guy, but he had signed on to um, anti-slavery track written by a non-slaveholding white from North Carolina, Hinton Rowan Helper. And for that, many Republicans had endorsed that, uh, showing that the slave power violated white people's rights too. You know, Southerners do not want him under any circumstances. And in the end, you end up with a compromise candidate in Pennington, who's a Republican, but a moderate Republican who hadn't signed on to this document. He was a freshman lawmaker or a first term. Exactly. (laughs) I mean, he was probably the last one to expect that he would become the Speaker of the House. William Pennington, whose name would be totally forgotten if it not been for this. Yeah, because the very next election he loses, right? He was Speaker for in a blink of eye and then he lost. But, 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 you know, he is elected, but that was also a long election, not as long as the banks issue. 44 ballots. There were 44 ballots. But the fact that you had these Republican speakers in the House and that the North had gained a majority in the House really showed that the Republican Party would be the main sort of opponent to the Democratic Party, which had become so pro-slavery that on the eve of the Civil War, the Democratic Party platform, the Southern Democratic Party platform was a federal slave code and Some of them were agitating for the reopening of the African slave trade that had been abolished in 1808. So that's how pro-slavery and extreme they were. And it it results in the breakup of the Democratic Party in Charleston, South Carolina, with Douglas as the Northern Democratic candidate and Breckenridge on this extreme pro-slavery platform. And he wins most of the South. Chasm was unbridgeable at that point. So we now know today where all of this was headed, toward civil war. Although it would be wrong to say that a war was a surprise because not just talk, but threats of disunion and secession were in the air for quite a while. And then they are realized after Lincoln wins. So my final question to seg back to the current moment is... When it comes to the important lessons or the right parallels to draw from what we've been talking about here and then applying them to what's going on today, I get the sense that there are some lessons that we need to learn, but it's not clear what they are because we're not headed towards civil war. We're not in a conflict over slavery. But I think, as we mentioned at the top of the conversation, we are in a in a fight over the nature of liberal government. Exactly. I do think that we shouldn't downplay the threat to our government. What happened in January 6th, you know, a lot of people said, you know, this is not who we are. It, the U.S. is known for the peaceful transfer of power. But there were others who said, no, no, this is who we are. There are these instances of political violence from the past, of racist terror, uh, the overthrow of Reconstruction in the South that shows that this has happened in the past. I am one of those who thinks, you know, somewhere in the middle. We certainly don't want to go back to the 19th century, and certainly not to the Jim Crow South, where democratic governance was completely vitiated, right? Where 
the Black population was completely disfranchised. We can't go back to that place. I don't think we are on the verge of the Civil War. There are journalists like Stephen Marsh. There are uh, even scholars who say, oh, we are on the verge of another Civil War. As a Civil War historian, I will assure all your listeners, we are not on the verge of the Civil War. Slavery was an enormous divisive issue that tore the country apart and resulted in the war. We have no such thing in that respect, you know, a geographically defined interests with the political elites at that point determined to leave the Union. Yes, there's some crazy tenthers in Texas and Florida who occasionally want to defy federal law and want to secede from the Union, but they're, they're a minority. They don't have a political movement the way the secession movement had Absolutely. throughout the 1850s. What we have today is something different, but it's not less dangerous. What we do live in terms of civil war history is the long afterlives of slavery, the long afterlives of all those contestations over black citizenship, the long afterlives of overthrowing interracial democracy in the South during Reconstruction. We live with those legacies and those political issues haven't completely gone, though they come up in different ways today. Till today, there are people who are regarded as legitimate Americans and others as illegitimate American citizens. And that's a really dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. The other dangerous thing is the threat of authoritarianism. And this is a global phenomenon. It's happened in the U.S., but you see it, what happened in Brazil recently with the supporters of Bolsonaro storming Brasilia, the government buildings there. You see that in Viktor Orban's Hungary, where he has a semblance of a democratic government, but it's an authoritarian government completely with no freedom of press. Right. So, illiberal democracy is how they describe it. I don't know if you can be an illiberal Democrat, but... Exactly. I think there's a term for that, right? <laughs> uh, two words that are completely opposed to each other and that don't make sense. It's the way the Nazis call themselves socialists, right? Um, or national they, socialists, yeah. But yeah, go national, ahead. Why they persecuted socialists, trade unions, unionists, etc. But, but the point remains, you know, that I think the real threat today is this authoritarian tendency and the tendency to play the us versus them divisive card that demonizes a group of people or sees some people as less legitimate to play on the country's long history of divisions, whether it's along lines of race, whether it's along lines of politics, uh, etc. I think to, to dig that wound rather than to try and address it and overcome it. You know, Lincoln was great at this, appealing to the better angels of our nature, but at the same time not compromising on anti-slavery principle. We could have had a compromise of 1860, by the way, if Lincoln had agreed to it. That's right which was that he gives up basically the platform that he was elected on, which was the non-expansion of slavery. And he drew a line. He says, no, I'm going to stand on principle, but I'm still going to appeal to Americans, right? And we are still going to try and recreate that union that was created by the founders. And so Lincoln was actually quite good at this, at taking a principled stance on democracy and at the same time trying to create a political terrain in which slaveholders, etc., would not be able to destroy the Union. I think one of the reasons why Lincoln is a moderate before the Civil War is he's always balancing his genuine anti-slavery feelings with his devotion to the Union and Constitution. And I've written about this, I write about this in my book. But when the slaveholders commit treason, when they break up the Union, he doesn't have to do that anymore because they've actually try to overthrow the constitution and break the union. And I think that's what we need today. We need to identify that threat, argue for a system where at least both the major parties would believe in those basic democratic precepts. And it's not just a question of norms. It's a question of law also. Mm -hmm. You're actually breaking the law too, if you do not accept the results of elections or if you peddle in, in conspiracy theories that result in actual harm to a lot of people. Manisha Sinha of the University of Connecticut, we thank you for reminding us there's never a bad time to return to Lincoln. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to discuss an issue that is vital for the health of our democracy. 
and that is American empire and our sprawling security commitments across the globe. We're going to take a look at the history of the War Powers Resolution and why it's never been effectively used to end a foreign military adventure in the context of the ongoing war in Yemen. That's next as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 